Well, welcome for those who woke up and who are staying up. I'm based in Canberra. I'm uh, Irena, and I'm the one that you can see. And um, Leslie. Hi. No, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, you are there. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Okay. I'm Leslie, uh, as I was just saying. Yeah, you, unfortunately, you can't see me. We, we did test this out. This was our third test, and it worked perfectly every time. But today, you're going to just see Irene, and you will hear me and also hear from Irene. So welcome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us at um, crazy times of the day for some of you. So um, I was going to start with a little background about why this whole series uh, started and uh, before we start with all the questions that were submitted by various people. So as you saw from some of the first blogs in particular, I've been working on a number of uh, assignments, uh, questions from different organizations about voice and feedback and participation. And I started to feel, having been working in the sector for about 25 years now, that there was a little bit of a, a, a circle, a loop coming back. And then I encountered Leslie's work on beneficiary assessment. And we started to, well, the idea of a, of a blog series grew out of this to say, well, what is new about the current wave of interest in this topic? Um, and what are the different names under which it, it lurks and is present? And so we... Um, we had some great chats to figure out, well, what are the key messages that are not about the nitty gritty necessarily of, of methods? And that's how the blog series kind of developed from what we thought were the most salient points from where we felt people uh, were asking questions and asking for guidance. So and then we wanted to round off, of course, a series of participation, um, participation with a more participatory form of, of engagement, which is why we thought we would have this, this conversation. Um, that was fueled by, by your curiosities. And uh, we have a few questions of our own if there's time at the end that we would like to pose to you, but we'll see if we get to that stage. So what we've done is um, we are going to, we've grouped the questions together into groups of about two or three that you submitted in advance. And we're gonna to talk to those um, for about three or four minutes each, and then we'll open the floor for your comments and questions. Um, and neither Irene nor myself position ourselves as having all the answers. We're all learning together. So hopefully you'll be able to um, add insights to the questions of the other people in the group um, uh, as much as we can. So we'll make that space. So I think that's the logistics. Um, and I'll now hand back to Irene to just sort of talk us through very briefly um, the four blog posts, because we have made the assumption that you've all read them so that we can sort of just jump on from there. Um, so in our first blog post, which appeared um, in June, we basically said what we were going to talk about, what are the main issues. Uh, we talked about the importance of choice, uh, the importance of um, different approaches for framing it, and also some of these myths. And we introduced some of these, these notions and particularly focused on some of the fuzzy terminology that exists out there with people using the term participatory evaluation to mean a whole range of different practices. Um, and then we um, elaborated in the other three blogs on some of these key issues. We decided very consciously not to detail the methods side of it, to say, well, this is a more participatory method than that, because for us, that was a little bit of a red herring. You know, all methods can be undertaken in more or less participatory ways. But we need to focus on issues of, um, of definition, of, around power. That was the second blog that really power is at the heart of it. And we'll come back to that issue in, the, in some of the questions that are asked. How much power are we willing to, to hand over um, in our practice, in, a, in how we commission and how we make choices? And then where do those choices lie, which was the focus of the third blog, where we offered a number of different frameworks, simple frameworks that we found very helpful to figure out, to kind of break down this blob, this big possibility of participation into something that is more operational. Um, and I think that will be referred to again in some of the questions. And then finally, we dwelt in a little bit more depth on some of the um, reasons why, why we've heard people hesitate about going down a more participatory route um, in the last blog, which was about busting some of these myths. And overall, the series was really not about saying the only and the best way to do evaluation is to do it in the full-fledged, full-on participatory way for which we have a specific definition, but um, is to try and encourage people who hesitate about um, taking on a more participatory uh, approach to, to start to consider it. 
So that was really the, the audience that, that the blogs were speaking to. So on to the questions, I guess. Yeah, Nick, if you don't mind taking us to the next slide. Um, so we grouped, um, quite a lot of questions came in. Um, unfortunately, some came in just five minutes before we started um, from, from Beth Nelson, who I don't think is actually with us right now. But for the audio, Beth, we haven't had a chance to process those questions. But I think um, they talked to quite a lot of the questions um, that we're going to be talking through today. So hopefully you'll feel that your needs are met there. So we had about eight groups of questions. The first one was around sort of meaning and defining participation evaluation, participatory evaluation. Um, the second group was around power and politics, um, which is great because for us, this really is all about power. Um, the third set of questions that you gave us were around sort of framings and, and process for, for engaging participation and evaluation. There was a specific request for some examples around um, impact evaluation. We had specific question around um, sort of comparing the private sector and, and what they get up to with the sort of humanitarian development sector that, that we're working in. We had um, a question around ethics and confidentiality and then some sort of judgment questions. Is participatory evaluation better? You know, are you saying that this is the way to go? Is this, is this the one perfect route we should all be sort of working towards? And then the last one was, well, how do we make it meaningful? How do we actually make it a meaningful process for all that are involved? So um, I will, we will stop at, each, at the end of each one of those sort of clusters. And I can see from the participant list of, of those of you who are with us, I know that a lot of you have got tremendous experience and will have some really good examples to share with us. So please don't be shy. This is a joint learning um, experience. So, so please do come in and share your examples with us. So I'll just fire into the, the first cluster which was around meaning and, and, and defining. And I think these, these three questions were sort of talking to, to a similar thing. Um, so I'm not going to read through the questions, but basically the first one was, is a very common question um, that we get asked, which is commissioners ask for participatory approaches. They put it in the terms of reference. And um, then when explaining what they mean, they say, oh, and we expect a few focus group discussions. And then the consultants go off, get the information, analyze it, generate the report, give it back to the managers. And then it gets shared around um, a little bit with the program project staff um, who make some comments. Does this qualify um, as a participatory process? What type of participation can we qualify this as? Um, so what was very interesting in the research that Irene and I did, we did sort of big mappings um, uh, asking practitioners, evaluation practitioners, to send examples that they felt reflected good practice in terms of participation and evaluation. And it was quite interesting that we received overwhelming numbers of examples that were really very much about one-way data extraction. So, for example, I had quite a few examples shared with me around SMS surveys. Um, and people felt, well, you know, if we're asking people to feedback on what they think about a program through an SMS, this is a participatory method. Um, and so I think that's a big question. To what extent can we call those kind of methods um, participatory evaluation? And in blog one, Irene and I sort of provide our definition of participatory evaluation. And we're very strict about this. For us, an evaluation is participatory, um, where there's a very clear commitment to principles of empowerment and accountability. So where stakeholders are brought in as co-evaluators um, with the intention not only to ensure the inclusion of their voices in the process, but also to increase their own evaluation capacity. And, and for us, that's a very clear, very boundary use of the term participatory evaluation. Anything that doesn't have that intention um, and actual practice, we would not classify as a participatory practice, a participatory evaluation. So in terms of the second question, does participative evaluation assume participative goal setting as a necessary precondition for success? If goals are not set collectively, how legitimate is a participatory evaluation? Well, we would answer, well, if goals are not set collectively, then it's not a participatory evaluation. However, that doesn't mean um, that it's not legitimate to have different types of participation, um, different types of participatory methods used at different stages of the evaluation. So even if the goals of the evaluation were not select, set collectively, there's still obviously a large scope for participation and for using participatory methods. 
so that talks a little bit to the third question. Um, there are different levels of citizen participation from informing consultation, partnership, delegated power, citizen control. Um, how can we incorporate these levels of participation when undertaking evaluations? Um, are there degrees of participation that evaluators can adhere to when undertaking an evaluation? Um, and our answer is absolutely. And, and this was sort of our mission with the blog series was to start to try and deconstruct the language and to try and encourage people to be crystal clear when they use the term participatory evaluation, when they use the terms participatory methods, when they use the terms participatory approaches, to be really clear about what it is that they mean. And, and our sense is that's the only way we're going to be able to assess the quality of participation and to set a level of ambition that we in the evaluation community can say, right, if you meet this level of ambition, that's a participatory evaluation. If you don't, um, it's a different level of ambition. Maybe you'll have a participatory approach in your design. Maybe you'll use participatory methods in your implementation. Maybe you'll use a participatory approach in how you validate your findings. So it's really about trying to call a spade a spade. So I think on meaning and definition, my three minutes are probably up. Um, so I hope that answers the questions of the three people who set it. But I'd like to open the floor to the rest of you um, if you feel that was not an, a satisfactory explanation or if you have other thoughts when you were reading um, the definitions we put in the blog. So if you'd like to come in, could you please just um, type in comment into the comment box that we can bring you in? John, if you want to unmute your button in the toolbar. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hi, John. Um, I always uh, look at the, the whole notion of participation. Of First of all, mi at, at, at best, probably minimising the, the, the barriers to participation, whether they be in, in issues of, and they normally are of gender, but you know the whole notion of literacy, all sorts of politics, all, all, all those issues, minimising those. And then I started to think about the, the whole notion of uh, well, if people really want to participate anyway. So the whole notion of, of equity in what it is, whatever it is that we're actually evaluating, the people have actually something to contribute anyway. So the notion of, of, of participation needs to begin long before the evaluation of whatever it is we're evaluating comes about. The whole notion of having had equity in the, the project, the program, whatever it might be, the, 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 the change process, so that you actually have something to contribute into the evaluation to be able to effectively participate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that, um, makes, that, makes, my, that makes absolute sense. Yeah, I guess my reaction would be that, that even, even if you're not in an equitable, um, you know, in a, in a program or project or some whatever policy intervention even where you might not have been benefiting equitably, you will have had an experience that is worthy of being heard about. Um, and you will um, have, you might have developed a curiosity about what it's like for the others and, and collectively. So I, I'm not sure that I would say that, that I think it can work better in context where there's a culture and a precedent of engagement, but I'm not sure that it's a, a necessary precondition for then doing participatory evaluation. Um, and, and, and also, this is also about how you design your evaluation. And I think if you if you do just um, if we you know, if we're in a situation where we do end up just sort of coming into a community um, and, and being put in front of a focus group discussion of people who don't know why they're there and have just sort of been dragged in to talk to the evaluators, um, then I think we can't expect contributions to be as meaningful as they might be if during the evaluation, the design phase, we're very clear um, in terms of maybe, you know, advertising the evaluation, um, getting people to do some awareness raising about the evaluation, saying here are the questions that we're going to be asking. Um, would you like to participate? Here are some different times that might work for you. Could you go around and talk to other stakeholders in your community? You know, how you set it up 
so that when you do actually go into the implementation proper, people have had an opportunity to give informed consent mm. to actually provide informed input can also go quite a long way to ensuring that people can contribute a bit more meaningfully. I agree. Um, if I can make one other comment, I, I agree. And, and Irene, and your, your point about um, even people who have perhaps not necessarily been actively involved, and I used to have that uh, that take on it, you know, that old person who sits under the tree, never participates in anything, still got an opinion, he's observed or, or, or done all sorts of things. But then I came to the, to the thing about do they actually have something con to contribute? It's, it's well and good to try and minimise barriers to participation, allow people who've got, uh, who, who wish to participate to actually do so, but you need to have actually something to contribute so that in the outputs of the evaluation, the, the, uh, the, the, the findings, the conclusions, the recommendations, that whether it be in, in terms of gender, uh, class, age, status, whatever, you are truly represented there. But you need to have had equity in whatever it is that is being evaluated to be able to do that. Yes. To, to do that ideally, yes. And that doesn't mean we can't do our best in the meantime. Okay. And that we can't be incredibly honest about who, and I think this is where it's very important for us as the evaluation community to be very honest when we put in tenders, um, when we write up our reports, when we meet um, clients, to be very explicit and very clear about what they can actually expect if they're only prepared to put X budget or X time, you know, to flag up, well, this is the limitations. Which takes us very nicely into politics and power. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, so I think as we were writing this, power just kept coming up and up and up, didn't it, Irene? It was sort of the sort of often it's the elephant in the room um, that, that affects so much, including John's sort of equity question. So we were sort of two things that came up is, do you have any advice to provide a compelling argument to senior management to encourage them to adopt participatory practices and evaluation? Um, and, and one thing that, that really did come up is people don't seem to have a problem with getting participatory practices into the sort of data extraction process. So people don't seem to have so much of a problem if we say, well, let's have some PRA methods um, alongside some focus group discussions alongside our survey. But where, where people seem to really get stuck is the participation in the design, the participation in the validation in, in coming to evaluative judgments, in the dissemination communication. Um, and, and that's a question we're going to throw back to you at the end um, around the sort of why, why is an evaluation community do do we have more of a problem in other parts of the evaluation phase with, with sharing power so sort of a, a response to a specific response to the arguments for senior managers i mean people often say to me well you know the commissioners don't want it but irene and i discussed this and in our experience we've always managed to persuade commissioners to take a participatory approach to their evaluation um, and, and i think the first step to doing that is to really try and understand who it is that you're talking to so you know what's driving your senior management is, is, is do they have a focus on empowerment is their focus on rigor and robustness of the evaluation processes and results is it about sustainability is it about value for money what is it and then really try and talk to those specific points so for example if your organization has an empowerment focus you know really claims to be an organization that engages in, in an empowerment agenda then you can talk to the argument about bringing people who are concerned by the initiative not only as part of our human rights commitment you know that's enshrined in international law but also that bringing people stakeholders into the evaluation gives them a sense of ownership over the evaluation process which gives people a lot of skills in critical thinking analyzing data sharing their own experiences questioning assumptions of outsiders and this is very empowering and it's also part of local capacity building which is part of our commitments under the Paris Declaration. So it also gives people an interest in understanding findings of the evaluation for themselves and, and, and in learning from the findings and making, maybe taking them forward themselves. So what I find very frustrating is lots of evaluations will flag up good practices or practices that haven't been effective. Um, and then we don't share 
share these with other communities who might be engaging in similar experiences, which means they might end up repeating the same mistakes or not being able to learn and adapt good practices to their own context. And, you know, maybe if they were able to take on these findings, they could actually take programmes forward with less and less donor support. Um, and that really talk, takes us to the point about sustainability. Um, if your manager's focus is on evaluation rigor and, rigor and robustness, then I think we've got lots of arguments, too, that we sort of pull out in the blog and, and that I pull out in the DIVID paper. You know, you could argue that, well, outsiders may not know the right questions um, to ask or who the right people to ask are. Um, they may not know that three evaluations have already happened in the last month in that one village. Um, and it might make sense, more sense to use that data and build on it and then maybe take a new sample of people. Um, and you wouldn't know that unless you'd had a participatory approach to your evaluation. So, um, sorry, I could just talk about this for a long time, but I better stop. Um, power relations in the community. Yeah, absolutely. This is why Irene and I choose to use the word intended beneficiaries, because I think community is quite problematic. Um, specific strategies. Um, working with village elites, I think that's not something that can be avoided. I think they are gatekeepers and we need to respect that. They can be useful gatekeepers. They could be ethical gatekeepers as well. But the question of representation comes in and I think that's where a good stakeholder analysis is absolutely essential to try and decide who you then also might want to work with. Are there any other comments on questions on politics and power? Okay, John's got one. Anybody else? Go on, John, then. Sorry, I don't want to take... Yeah, uh, okay. One of the... In, in terms of politics and power, you know, the, whoever has asked this uh, second question there about strategies and whatever, one of the tools I've found is the, the, the very best tool is the 10T technique. I don't know whether anybody is uh, familiar with it, use it or whatever. Is the, John, is, John, you might need to be more. It's very hard. To, I find it hard to hear you. Can you speak into your microphone a bit more? Sorry. The 10 C technique. If people are familiar with the 10 C technique, it is one of the most um, empowering, one of the most leveling, and one of the most learning data collection and data, data sharing uh, tools that that I'm familiar with. I, I think it is the very best. Um, and and it it helps to eliminate a lot of those uh, power gradients within communities. And I've used it extensively across uh, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And, and, and comments that often come back from people, significant people within communities, chiefs, um, headmasters of schools and various things, is one of the most common comments is how much... I've learned from this experience. How much I learned about my people that I didn't know before. And uh, if if people haven't um, availed themselves or are not familiar with that tool, uh, if you just go into a search engine, type in 10 C technique, there's a great PDF document a bit there about it. Fantastic. Okay, so there's a few uh, requests Thanks, for John. writing. The name of the tool or sending a link, because I also didn't catch the exact term, I have to say, um, but that would be great. Yeah. It's just called the 10 seed, T E N S W E D technique, T E C K N I Q U E. Could you T E N C Q U A D? <laughs> this is okay. Let's not spend yeah, time that's on it. this. Ten seed, ten seed agricultural. Yeah, we've written it in the chats. The ten seed. Okay. <laughs> Great. Right. Excellent. Thanks. All right. So moving on. So there's, there's there are a lot of different techniques out there about uh, you know dealing with safe spaces and um, elite capture. There's a lot written from in the early nineties actually on that in the PRA literature. So it's worth going back to some of that. Um, there's also a book that um, I helped edit in the early 1990s called The Myth of Community, where we were looking particularly at including marginalized um, groups in participatory processes. So really, there's quite a lot we could draw on. We just have to go back to history, I guess, a bit. So the next set of questions are, um, we, we, we 
are about how do you combine and what I call framings with process. So there was a question around realist evaluation and how that could be combined and made more participatory and, and as well as gender equality approach. And I wanted to make a, a general comment without going into the specifics of how you would do it by saying they're, they're two different things and they can be combined quite easily. So realist evaluation is simply a way of, of, of framing your evaluation question. It's, it's asking what works, for, uh, what works for who, why and why not, under which conditions. So rather than saying, did it work, which is you know, a very common way to frame an evaluation, it's much more precise. So within that, um, and in fact, a realist evaluation requires actually much more thought about who there needs to be involved in providing inputs on this experience, certainly at the data level. So it, it's, it's quite a nice, um, you know, it can combine quite well, but you can still do realist evaluation in, um, in quite an, ex, um, an extractive way if that's what you choose or if that's what the, you know, the needs are. So it's not an automatic connection, but because for me, the participatory aspect of it is really how you would then go about undertaking a realist evaluation. Um, Jill Westhorpe, um, um, who's written a very good piece um, as part of the Better Evaluation uh, Program of Work on realist evaluation for impact evaluation, she's, she's definitely one of the writers to watch on this, in this whole space. So just to add on, on gender equality, it's in a way, it's the same issue. It's, well, in fact, it, it goes a little bit further, actually, because both um, Leslie and I feel that if you uh, want to do a participatory evaluation and you don't have a gender equality um, approach in that, it's not really participatory, right? So it's, it's one of the criteria by which you can know whether you're doing good participatory work. But participatory techniques, so that's an aspect of the evaluation, is participatory. Um, I think it's about being very um, clear about the, the gender equality approach has an aspect of certain kinds of questions, as well as um, ensuring that those questions are addressed by, um, by the different views that need to speak to uh, gender different different differentiated ways of, of, um, of the experience, the project or the program. So um, I don't know, I, I'm not sure I understand the aspect of playing with participatory techniques, but it's, it's about bringing a gender lens and making sure that it's part of however you choose to make your evaluation more participatory. So, I mean, there's lots of nitty gritty stuff to say about this, um, but I think in general, it's about saying there's a question, a way of framing, which are, um, as well as a process, and they're very, you can combine them quite well. Um, Patricia gave a link to Jill's, uh, one of Jill's papers um, in the chat box for those of you who are interested. Are there any questions around these two or comments around these two questions? None at all. Okay. Well, then moving on to impact evaluation, uh, this was a question about somebody who is um, piloting an approach to impact evaluation and wants to make it as participatory as possible. But where are the examples to be inspired by? And um, well, it was a question I asked myself um, and last year, in fact, when I um, uh, was asked uh, also as part of better evaluation to write for UNICEF a piece on participation in impact evaluation. And there was almost nothing out there that I could find. Many of the examples uh, of evaluations that were sent to me were as Leslie already mentioned about simply asking people, which is just part of good evaluation practice. It's not making it more participatory. Um, so there are very few examples out there. One of the pieces of work I've been involved in quite recently from which these photographs come is actually being piloted um, through funding from IFAD. Um, okay, we'll come back to your comment in a moment, John. Um, so the, the impact evaluation work um, that's being funded by IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, as well as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, asked myself and some of my colleagues to develop an, uh, pilot a new approach that is 
about participatory impact assessment and learning. And we set out to try and go beyond just the data collection uh, part of it, which is the, the easy uh, part of it and the most commonly uh, the, you know, used, I suppose. Um, and some of that material is available. The, the, the report on the pilot program in Vietnam is available. I can send that to you. And there will be a web page coming up soon with lots of guidance material after the pilot in Ghana is finished. But essentially what we said is um, we redefined rigor to be about being inclusive, not just statistical. So I think that was an important kind of um, principled stance that we took. And we took very small and simple steps. So we said, uh, rather than just having the TOC from the project, the official log frame being the way that, you know, that we're framing the, the questions, let's have it critiqued by others, not just the program staff. So we had sessions where the program the theory of change was, was developed and critiqued by um, a lot of the other state agencies and service providers involved in this program of work on market development. Very small step to just step beyond the boundaries of project staff. Um, at the analytical stage, well, we use a lot of PRA methods and um, as well as surveys, by the way. But then at the end of each community engagement, we had a, a validation exercise with um, uh, community members um, that were attended by people who'd been involved during the week in some of the, the, the discussions where we sought validation of the initial conclusions. Um, so we said, this is what we've been hearing. Um, and what we then did is we asked the people who had been classified locally as the, the marginalized and the poor, they were allowed the first vote, the first comment on accuracy and validity of some of these comments, after which the floor was open to others. And we had a debate about whether these conclusions from the, the observations were actually accurate and uh, for who they represented, whose truth they represented. And then we had a very large validation workshop with over 100 people where for the first time project staff engaged analytically at the, at the program level um, with community leaders and other service providers. And that's the bottom photograph where we had people uh, who normally don't present and don't share their findings um, kind of comment on, on causality so there are examples, but it's very, they're very limited. Um, so I can certainly share that one with you. So moving on. Uh, no, there was a comment, I believe. John, you had a comment or a question. Uh, John? On, the, on the previous one, yeah, yeah, on the, uh, just in, in relation to the, the gender issue, but we could, that might come up again later on after. All right, I'm sorry, I, I didn't, um, I, I, would have, I was a bit too fast. <laughs> Um, do come back to it if we don't mention it. So private sector. So that was an interesting question. Is Are we, well, you refer to the private sector evaluations as being inherently participatory driven because they are driven by the need to listen to clients. What experience do we have to back that up? Because the private sector also has to keep a brand clean, right? Okay, so I went back to the blog um, that we, in which we mentioned the private sector as you know, a possible source of inspiration. And I think that, first to clarify, I'm not sure that we say that their evaluations are participatory, but I do think that we, what we refer to is, is that they are um, uh, much more used to, to uh, listening to clients because the clients are the source of their survival you know, their future, if you don't have, and, and Leslie gave a really interesting example when we were discussing these questions about Coca-Cola that does in-depth research and they know exactly what the Coca-Cola drinkers do on a Saturday afternoon at 4 p.m. in certain communities in the U.S. They really have, they really understand and they market towards that. I'm not saying that's positive, but it's in terms of, of, of Coke and what it's contributing to society. But it's, it's that culture of, of investing in understanding and listening. And so that takes part place often at the design phase for the marketing. I think that there's quite a few evaluations of the private sector um, that are not at all participatory. You know, in fact, very closed doors um, because um, I'm working quite a bit with the private sector and I'm finding it extremely hard to get any examples from them of evaluations um, that they're willing to share. 
But I think this notion of, of, you know, it being about the client and listening to client is something that is triggering, in part triggering this, this current interest in international development, where you have this whole movement around feedback, um, constituency feedback, uh, beneficiary assessment. Um, could we go back to the previous slide, please? Um, and I think so. I think it's 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 almost as though the international development sector is opening up to the importance of being much more, have many more ears to the ground. So I don't know if people have any comments on that question. Okay, um, time is just flying. I don't know where where it's going. So let's um, let's move on, shall we, to ethics and confidentiality. Um, so this 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 question um, sort of stands by itself, really. So how can ethics and confidentiality be taken into consideration whilst ensuring that all those important to the evaluation are involved in the evaluation process? Um, now, for me, ethics apply whatever we do. Um, I was at a very interesting workshop recently, which was um, about ethical evaluation. And, and I couldn't understand why we were having a workshop on ethical evaluation, because ethics should underpin all forms of evaluation. And I think that's no different when it comes um, to, to participatory evaluation or to engaging participation in evaluation. We should be very strictly abiding by ethics. And, and, and often we don't see that. So when we see terms of reference or we see proposals, there's a sort of tick box, we will abide, abide by ethical principles. But quite often it's not spelled out. Um, and, and I think that as an evaluation community is something that we should be really pushing forward on across the board. Now, obviously, when it comes to confidentiality, um, and we are doing data collection collectively or design collectively or validation collectively, um, there are going to need to be some additional um, questions around confidentiality. So, um, you know, how will you select your group? How will you ensure that the safe space is sort of created? Will you make sure you've got facilitators who are really skilled in safe space making? How will you negotiate the conditions of the participation? And all these are really important questions um, around confidentiality that are absolutely um, essential. Um, so I think that's that's probably all I want to say on that. So ethics, cross cuts, all, all, all the evaluations we do, confidentiality. Yes, there are some specific um, questions that you're going to have to think about very carefully in, in your design and that you will want to follow up on. Has anybody else got anything to add to ethics and confidentiality? Has anybody had any experiences um, where, where they've sort of got into trouble from a confidentiality perspective where the safe space wasn't wasn't insured? John, anybody else? Uh, John, just, comment. just a comment, uh, Leslie. And in terms of um, the whole notion of uh, if 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 we minimise the barriers to participation or eliminate them if possible, which is probably the best we can minimise them, if people then choose to participate, we provided a, an ethical environment. And the whole notion of confidentiality is then left to that person, I, I think. So if we, if we provide opportunities that provide confidentiality or um, allow people to, to speak publicly if they choose to, that whole notion of confidentiality is, is, is in their court, but we provided an ethical environment in which... They, they can participate if they choose to do so. If we provide um, the whole notion of different methods by which they can participate. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, I think what, what, if I can comment as well, one of the traps I find, um, people, people assume that being participatory means being qualitative. People assume that being participatory means doing everything in groups. I don't, for me, that's not how practice works. You can be very participatory by, for example, doing quite a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews, but then anonymously, for example, bringing that information into a collective forum for analysis by those people who have given their information um, in that one-on-one -on -one encounter. So, um, I think that um, it doesn't have to be. Um, yeah, I think I think the confidentiality can be 
maintained um, by how you choose to combine the individual and the group kind of context in um, in these types of processes. Well, I agree with you, Aaron. And um, and and I, I, I used uh, a, a number of tools. One of which is I don't know whether you're familiar with a, a pocket chart, which yes, yeah, enables, yeah. And that and that that enables um, uh, confidentiality. Uh, I used a ten C technique. Uh, I use uh, what I call appreciative inquiry informed discussion group because not necessarily a uh, focus group because I don't necessarily have uh, representatives of all the various demographics. But the three methods, the three tools give me a degree of um, triangulation around an issue. They give people the opportunity to choose the, the way in which they might wish to engage whether they uh, choose to do it publicly or they uh, confidentiality or, or, or whatever. I think that whole notion of confidentiality um, can then be placed upon them to choose the method in which they uh, wish to engage. But because um, we've provided those opportunities and, and maybe done it in, in a way which doesn't require uh, literacy skills, uh, we might have done it um, pictorially, photographically, asked, the way we've asked the question. We've provided a very ethical environment mm. in, in that we, and not disadvantaged or, 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 or highlighted or, or um, targeted any particular group. Mm. Thank you. That's really helpful, John. And um, I'm sure we can people can go and Google pocket charts and and and, and the ten seed method. Um, and I think the point you're also talking to is about giving people to provide an ethical environment is also about giving people the information that they need as well to be able to make that choice. So yeah, one one thing that another question that came up is: Are you saying that participatory evaluation is better? No, we're not. Yes. And Always. I think that's something we're very, very clear about. Um, Irina and I are both participatory practitioners. We love doing participatory evaluation. But the first, first question we will always ask is trying to get a better understanding of our context. So we need to understand uh, the operating environment of the program, the operating environment where the evaluation is going to take place, that we can really understand the constraints, safety issues, risks, et cetera, et cetera, and the evaluation context. So What's the purpose of the evaluation? Is it accountability? Is it learning? What resources are available? Is there scope for adaptive programming? So we've got an awful lot of questions that we would want to ask before we ever in a position to make the choice, okay, we're going to have a participatory evaluation. So even if a terms of reference asks for a participatory evaluation, I, and possibly Irene as well, would still want to have that understanding before we could say, okay, that is the best approach. So I think it's about choosing the approach, the methodology, um, that best suits your evaluation environment and then you're going to make choices around am I going to have a participatory approach am I going to have use participatory methods am I going to do a participatory evaluation so there's different choices that you're going to make along the way at different stages of the evaluation yeah so it's, it's shades of participation with the kind of purest form being participatory evaluation yeah yeah Okay, so as part of this question set, um, we had a, um, uh, a question talking about the flip side, when can it be said to not work? And then an example was given, and we looked at the example, and we weren't sure that the example was actually an example of participatory evaluation. Because if you look at it, it says that health providers provided inputs in focus group discussions about service improvement, and the program adopted some of those formally, yet there was no improvement discerned. So what we don't know is whether the only, whether it was the focus group discussions that was the definition of, of participation in this particular context, in which case um, uh, we, we, well, it could be that it wasn't extensive enough, but we don't have enough information to judge this, of course, that there might've been other conversations with other people that might have been important or to look at the incentives for change. Um, so we felt that, that there was a question here about, well, is this actually an example of participatory evaluation? Um, so uh, so that, was, that was one 
issue. But let's imagine that it was very, uh, that it was kind of the full blown purist form where there was a lot of engagement in design, etc. And that then um, there was no improvement discerned. It could well be that those few changes that were picked up uh, formally by the program were not those that made the, the biggest difference to routine practices. And so I think we have to be careful to separate out participatory evaluation, what the, the standards that we use to define participatory evaluation and, and its success versus um, uptake of, um, of um, all the recommendations and all the insights that are coming from, uh, from an evaluation process. So there's, 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 um, there's a slight difference there because uh, it could be that there's a lot of great ideas, but suddenly policy contexts change and there's no ability to actually implement some of those changes. So, but what this speaks to is the importance of defining ahead of time um, what you would consider to be a success in terms of the degree of participation that you're that you're um, you've, you're you're opting for in your evaluation and agreeing on that ahead of time, I think becomes uh, becomes quite important because you can go back and check and say, well, do people feel more empowered or do we feel we now have you know insights we would never have gained because we're asking people differently and different people differently. So um, it speaks to that issue of how do we define success of um, participation in evaluation or participatory evaluation. Are there any comments on that? Okay, we have one more set of questions and then we, well, we're rounding up to the, going to the end of our, our hour, quite phenomenally. Um, there's a danger with asking questions. <laughs> you get people who respond. <laughs> um, so we had questions about really the time, the balance between time and finances and how can you use those and balance those wisely to still make it meaningful. And I think um, it comes back to where we started in a way is looking at the context and saying, well, what are the boundaries that you have in terms of time and money? And uh, being aware to not make it tokenist tokenistic where you promise the earth in terms of participation, you can't deliver it, but where you very clearly define what's feasible and what would be, um, you know, value adding in this particular context. Um, so it's, it's impossible to say ensure, but I would, I would think that, that, that having that agreed joint definition um, and purpose for participation is a really important part of then deciding how to use time and money. Leslie, did you want to explain your little tip that you used for the last question? Oh, yes. I think I, I, we weren't quite clear about what this last question meant. I mean, when I read it, my interpretation was around how much time you, you sort of can 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 spend in, in, in the design phase. And my sense is often we can rush a design phase and rush certain, we can spend a lot of time in certain bits and then rush into, oh, yes, and we'll do some focus group discussions or, yes, we'll use participatory methods um, with, without spending the real time in trying to set up the evaluation as part of the design. So I, I often sort of challenge people to think about, well, if you were to spend a third of your evaluation time on design, a third on implementation, and a third on validation analysis, how, how would this be different for you? You know, would you spend a lot more time in doing participatory validation um, than you might if you're just sitting in, in, in your office sort of compiling your evaluative judgments? Um, if you had a third of your time in design, you know, would you be able to make that participation more meaningful? So that's just something I encourage people to have a think about. So we've got two questions for you, um, but I don't know if anybody's got a comment on this making participation meaningful before we move on to those. And we may just have to flag up those questions and, and see if people want to reply later in the comments box or on, um, on Better Evaluation site. And I think that there was a question from John still about gender. Oh, just uh, back on the, on the gender issue, the, the, the whole notion of uh, gender in a, uh, gender equality in evaluation, just harking back to that, um, the whole notion I was talking about before about equity um, on, on the better evaluation site. Uh, late last year, there was a, um, a gender equity issue. I put a, a, a blog up there and in the, uh, 
the, the first edition of the Australasian uh, Evaluation Journal this year. Uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, a, a journal article on on the whole notion of gender uh, gender equality in in the outputs of evaluation, and you know, I felt it was so important that the whole notion of the gender equality is so dependent upon the the actual equity having equity in whatever it is that is being evaluated, which I uh, mentioned before. Um, it's all well and good to try and involve. Um, you know, uh, women and men in, in data collection issues, but very often we find that, particularly the, for the women, they've been excluded from whatever it is you're evaluating. So at the time of the data collection, it, it, it's very often too late to address the issue of gender equality. It needs to have been done earlier. And if if we haven't had a, a, a real issue of... Or, I think we've got some background noise from someone. I think somebody's just got the okay, mic. Could, 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 could you round off? Because we're rounding, we're coming to the end of the hour. So. Yeah. So, so I. I my whole notion of um, the whole notion of, of gender equality in the evaluation is is dependent so much upon equity and whatever it is that's been evaluated, or that we have whoever it is that's representing um, men and women, they need to have at least had that equity issue so they can truly represent that. It's 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 too late when you get to the uh, data collection. Uh, phase that we, we look to have well equal numbers of men or equal numbers of women or whatever that we, that we okay do. I think that that's um, definitely very much also how I would see it um, and I wanted to mention that as part of the better evaluation products um, there's going to be a gender in impact evaluation uh, publication that actually speaks to this issue even though it's not about participation it does speak to this issue about when and how for meaningful um, insights on gender equity. And um, so I think that that's something to watch for, which we can possibly sh link to all the emails on this, on the, on the uh, attendee list. Um, okay, Leslie, did you want to comment on that at all? Uh, no, I just wondered if we could just um, flag up the two questions and maybe we'll post them on the, um at the bottom of the Better Evaluation blog and, and, and just ask participants to sort of reflect on them and maybe give us some answers um, either in the comments here before you go or on, online. So we've sort of got two questions for you. Um, does jargon matter? And this is one we've been thinking about a lot. Or are participation, voice and feedback simply decade relevant versions of the same intention? So in the 90s, we talked about participation in the noughties, voice and it, now it seems that feedback's the big word. Um, to us, they're talking about very similar things. What do you think? Um, and the second question is the extent to which our evaluations are participatory, ultimately only about our willingness and ability to share power over evaluation decisions? Easy. <laughs> Great. So um, I think that we had an hour lined up for this. Um, if people want to chat about this afterwards, then perhaps we could hang on for a few minutes, but I appreciate that people might need to uh, scoot. Um, so many thanks for this. We had more questions than we really uh, had time for, I feel. Um, any last comments from anyone? Yes, please, yep. Patricia is saying we can also discuss these in comments on your blog post. Yes, please. That would be absolutely fantastic. Let's keep the discussion going. I think we've got a, a, a really good um, community of practice going here and, and hopefully we can sort of keep going and keep discussing and keep chatting and sharing. Um, I think the blog posts will be up um, for quite a long time. So if you get any new resources, if you do some really exciting evaluations, can you post them up, share them with us? That would be fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Thank you. Thank you.